good to see y'all, and uh, we're looking forward to spending some time in, in learning about biblical forgiveness this morning. Take your Bibles and open up to 1 John chapter 1. We've been studying this, this book and, and looking at uh, exactly what it is that God wants us to know from, from the truth of 1 John. And, and we see in verse, I think it's 4, because I can't see because I'm so blind. And, and I'm, I'm looking every week for a new Bible. I mean, I keep on hunting for it. For the one with the right, that's not this big that I can hold in, in a hand and, and I can't find it yet. So I think it's verse 4, but it says that our, the purpose of writing these things is that our joy may be made complete. And, and isn't that just an encouraging thing? Because there's so many times we go through life and our joy just isn't complete. And how can we really get that in our lives? And, and so John writes. And, and, and as he writes, he tells us how that can, we can experience that. And he tells us in, in uh, the next verse, verse 5, that God is light. And, and that means an a indication of his truth and his moral righteousness. It, it's who God is. And it serves as a backdrop it serves as the backdrop for us to compare ourselves against. Because there was people in John's day that they, they wanted to know God, but they didn't know the real God. They, they knew some vague shadow of who God was. It was a religious God that they knew. They, they grasped onto that. Some of them were, were genuine. They wanted God, but they, they just didn't know how to get to him. And, and then there was others who were deceivers. They, they wanted to make God what they wanted God to be. Either way, there were people that were saying they were chasing after God, but, but they were missing it. And, and when they would sit in some kind of teaching like this, they'd say, something's missing in my soul. Something way deep down is, is missing. And, and I don't have that joy that, that others do. And, and we wouldn't want to admit that. And on the outside, we couldn't see that on anybody. You'd have to diagnose that yourself. And so John writes so that, so that our joy can be complete. He writes it for you. He writes this for you. And, and then he gives us these tests. And these tests help us to see what's going on with our relationship. Is it real or, or is there something that's, a, that's not right about it? And, and we see those in the following verses. He gives us three negatives and, and two positives for us to compare ourselves to. The first one is the test of darkness. It says in uh, verse, uh, I think that's, someone tell me if that's six. Yeah, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie. And, and we don't practice the truth. And so here's the light of God. It's shining brightly. And we stand in front of it to see what we look like in front of that light. And if we say, yeah, I walk with God. And, and yet, I, I walk in the darkness. God's saying, you're lying. It, something's not right with you. And, and so you need to examine your life. Are you walking with God? Of course, you're here on a Sunday morning. There's a lot of other things you could be doing this morning. But you're here. You give that appearance of godliness. But... In your soul, is, is there darkness that you're walking in? If you are, why are you missing that joy? It's because you're not real with your relationship with God. He gives us another negative example. We see it two verses up. It says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The first was a test of darkness. The second one is the test of deceit. If we, if we say that we have no sin, there's people who teach that we can have a perfection in this earth. We can't have a perfection in this earth. And in fact, anybody who just says that, just say, I'm coming over tomorrow and I'm going to spend the day with you. It, it won't take you very long before you're figuring out that their person's full of it. They, they, they have full of sin and, and they have everyone's sins. And, and so if you're the one who says, I, I've reached perfection, even in certain areas of my life, I've compartmentalized and, and I don't sin there, then then the Bible says that you've deceived yourself. You, you don't have the real faith. You, you, something's wrong. You don't understand your faith. He gives us a, a third test. It's um, the last verse of the chapter. It says, if we say we have um, not sinned, we make him a liar. There's others who would say, I, I don't need your God. I don't need Jesus. I, I don't need to sing these songs that say that we've been cleansed from our sin. I am not a sinner. I've never sinned. I, I'm perfect. Or, sin doesn't matter. We make God a liar because God says that all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. It says that everyone needs a Savior. It says everyone needs to chase after God. 
And there's people who come and they want to do the religious thing. They're even sincere about it. And yet they, they miss that. There's also two positive tests. We see it sandwiched in between these three negative tests. The first one is in verse 7. It says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, not as we define the light to be, because we could say, here's what I think God is, and I do just as good as God. No, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. There is no imperfection. If we walk like he walks, if we're striving to become more and more Christ-like, we call that progressive sanctification. Time, and we get saved here, and we grow to be more and more and more like Christ, although we'll never attend or attain his perfection on this earth. If, if we're striving to do that, we can say that we're truly people who've been born again. And then, the verse that we want to highlight today, verse 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is a, a hard pattern, but, but it really is. I think when I was a kid, I used to learn that, that the pastor was perfect. He's perfect. I never saw him do anything wrong. And that's because I didn't hang around with him. If I did, I would have found it. And, and we, we wouldn't acknowledge that, that we did things that were wrong. We wouldn't acknowledge that we'd fall. And so you know what I used to think sitting there? Am I in a crowd like this? Am I the only one here who's doing this? And of course I wouldn't stand up and ask that question. I'd be too embarrassed with all the perfect people I was with. It was so incredibly humiliating to me. And then as I grew in my faith and as I got to know more people more intimately, I thought, I'm not the only one that's struggling here. Every one of us struggles with sinning. Every single one of us. I do and you do. And here's the pattern of a, a true born-again person, a person who has a relationship with Jesus. We will fall short. But when we do, we'll come and we'll confess it. We'll say the same thing that God says about it. If God says, you've missed the mark here, we say, I missed the mark there. We say it exactly like God says it. And if we come with that kind of humble attitude to him, he says, I will forgive you and then I'll cleanse you. He'll cleanse us. And we get to this word forgive. It's an amazing word. And I think it's a confusing word. I think there's a number of people who are confused about this word, forgive. And I thought we would spend a couple weeks, this week and next week, talking about forgiveness. What does biblical under, uh, forgiveness look like? How, how does it work? And, and what does it feel like? And how do we identify it? How do we live it? How do we do it? How do we give it? How do we receive it? I thought we'd spend some time looking at that. There, there is... There is nothing, there is nothing that is more difficult and, and challenging for us to get. Because forgiveness, forgiveness is, is completely foreign to our sinful nature. You see, you, see, you know the, the, how it goes. It, it's, a, it's a hair crass. It says, you can't screw me and get away with it. Because do you know who you're messing with? You see, no one's messing with me and getting away with it. And you might say the same kind of thing. You might say the very... Nothing is more foreign to our human nature. But nothing, nothing is more characteristic of divine grace. Nothing paints a picture of who God is more than forgiveness. And so therein we see exactly who we are. We see who we are. Nothing is more foreign to our nature. And we see on the other end of the pole, we see that nothing is more characteristic of divine grace. And there is the picture of man desperately wanting an anti-God and God perfect in every single aspect with no darkness in him at all. And there is forgiveness. It's so elusive and so hard for us to grasp and to get. It's been said that, um, that no human relationship can exist long uh, in a long-term uh, relationship without the matter of forgiveness being part of it. Uh, how, about, how about Adam and Eve? You know, I heard this. It really crushed my bubble when I heard it, that they said that when Adam and Eve were together, that they might not have been by themselves for more than hours before they sinned. More than hours. And, and right away, they needed the forgiveness of God. Right away. Day one, 
hour three, they needed the forgiveness of God. Now, I don't know how it would be in your family, but let me just sit in a little secret. Say that was Cheryl and I. I can tell you that would have been a rough night for us in the Gray household if we were Adam and Eve. Cheryl would be saying something like this. Hey, you're the leader. Why didn't you tell me? Why? And, and I'd be saying something like, Cheryl, I told you to look at the fruit, not pick the fruit. And, and we'd be going at it. Not only would we need to get forgiveness from God, but we'd be at each other's throat. And then I'd probably say something mean like, huh, I didn't see this yesterday, but that fruit that you ate off that tree, it looks like you're getting a little chubby, honey. <laughs> I'd say something like this, and then I'd really be in the doghouse. You see, it's nasty in relationships. We're nasty to each other. And, and you can't exist in relationship with other people without having this tool of forgiveness. If not, then sin comes between us. And what does sin do? It always separates. Think of the word separate. It separates. It causes death. It causes destruction. It causes, it causes trouble and hassle. It causes pain. Sin comes in between us. We love each other, but it still spreads us apart further and further and further. And here's what we need to learn over and over and over and over again. Problems are meant for solving. Problems are meant for solving. You have problems, they're meant for solving. And when you have relational problems, they are meant for solving. It is unacceptable to have the Hatfields and the McCoys sitting on opposite sides of the church. It is not right. And God has given us this beautiful tool, this tool of forgiveness to help deal with that. And we're going to learn about that. It's not easy, but, but we can learn about it. Forgiveness is one of the most challenging areas of discussion. And, and it's challenging for, for this reason because there's many different opinions about the subject. We're going to find out. Like, like, can you forgive yourself? Can you forgive yourself? Is that a biblical concept? We'll learn about that next week. And, and how about, where does, I'm sorry, come into the picture? Uh, does that fit into the picture? And, and how about, I apologize. And does, where does that fit? And there's all this stuff that comes in and it's confusing. What does biblical forgiveness look like? How is it defined? What is the transaction that goes on? And how do we live it out? We'll learn more about the practical stuff next week. This week we're going to learn more about the details of it, okay? So we know that it's difficult because different opinions and it's also incredibly challenging to do in our life. It's hard to, it's hard to man up and say... Uh, I screwed up there. It's hard. Just really hard for us to do that. I had an occasion like that this week. Uh, I had to man up. I, I blew it. Uh, I sinned. Uh, I sinned typically. My sin, because everyone's got their bent. You got one and I got one. I'm doing the talk and I'll tell you what my bent is. It's with my mouth. I mean, it's my mouth. Sometimes I say things I shouldn't say and I'm a little bit aggressive. You hook aggressive in a mouth and you get a big, big problem. I have that problem. And, and I was aggressive and my mouth got in the way and, and I hurt someone and I was wrong. Wrong. I didn't want to admit it. Cheryl was helping me to see it. <laughs> she was helping me. I didn't see it, which caused another aggressive mouth problem going on there. And you could see how the day was going. And then God's Spirit convicted me and, and I got it right with the person and then with God. That's what we need to do. It's, why, is, why is this a tough subject? Because that doesn't feel like, wow, this is, I'm, I'm on top of my game. It doesn't make me think this is fun, this is easy. It's, it's, it's humbling, it's crushing to see Pastor Doug coming and having to act like that. It, it's hard for me to do that. And I would imagine that it's hard for you to do that too. That's why this is such a tough subject to talk about. Um, fallen humanity finds it incredibly hard to understand this concept of forgiveness. And we know firsthand how hard it can be to forgive other people who have wronged us. And, and when we know how hard it is to forgive other people who have wronged us, we then develop this idea about who God is. And, and in the development of the idea of who God is, we, we start to say this. There's two ways you can go. The, the first way would be, boy, God is hard. He, he deals with sin. And he's just, yeah, I get that. He, he's He's hard on sin and, and he's stern. And you know what I think God is? My perception is that he's, he's 
unloving and, and that he's harsh and, and that I can't do anything to please him. And, and there's people here that have that kind of a, a mindset about God, a bent that way. And, and then there's other people who think, but God is loving and, and in his love, he overlooks our sin. And, and he doesn't mind. In fact, he actually just justifies our sin. And, and so we have these two different poles. We, we have the pole where God is hard and won't forgive. And, and God is easy. He'll forgive everybody. And he's just easy. And, and it's hard for us to understand what's going on like that. Both misconceptions lead to fatally wrong conclusions about forgiveness. Compounding that uh, problem is our attitude towards uh, forgiveness tends to vary in our own individual lives. Um, when we're on the receiving end of forgiveness, when we're on the receiving end, like I wrong you and you have to forgive me, when we're on the, it's, it's very, very quick that I want to kind of have my bent go this way towards the forgiving God. God would forgive me and God would let me go and God would give me a second chance and won't you? It, so, it, and, and then... When you do something to me, then, then I'm going to morph this way and think, I must be just in the way I handle this. And there is payback. And I am going to insist that it happens and see that it gets done. And, and so there's people that are, that's the case. It's these different extremes that come on. And, and we can see how complicated these situations get. So we have problems, you and I. And, and, and I get it. I realize some of you today, I, I get this. I was thinking about this preparing. Some of you have been sinned against in heinous ways. I, I understand that. Wickedness has been done to you. And, and I never want to minimize that. We, we don't want to. So make sure that we are all on the same page. That when wicked things happen to people, we should grieve about that. So some people have been sinned about with wickedness. Some of you have been sinned against over a long period of time. You, you're married to a, to a guy who is belittles and beats and, and, and hammers you with his mouth. He comes to church with his big Bible, but he, he's just oppressive to you and to your kids. And, and it's so incredibly suffocating. You are up to here with that. Or, or you might be married to a woman who who feels that she doesn't have to be a mother or she doesn't have to be a wife and she doesn't fulfill her duties and, and it's so incredibly frustrating for you to, to live your life. It could be a whole bunch of things. Some of you have been hurt and damaged and some of you are the people who've committed those things. In fact, we all are. We all are. Some of us are haunted by the shame of our sin. And, and, and we're haunted. We're haunted by the by the guilt of our sin. And shame is a tool used by God. And, and guilt is a tool used by God. But if we don't use the tool of biblical forgiveness. Then shame and guilt will have this overwhelming effect. That should have been dealt with. And they should have been put in their place. But they're not. And if we don't have forgiveness. We are just overwhelmed with those kinds of feelings and emotions that come upon us. We're not here to minimize any of this stuff. So make sure when I say that... Uh, Forgiveness is something that you need to be living out that you're not thinking I'm just minimizing your situation. I, I don't know your situation exactly, but, but I am with you on it, okay? Um, your, your past memories, they've haunted you. I, I get that that's the case in many cases. There's this woman that's going to help us today with a number of quotes, and uh, I think you'll find them to be beneficial. Uh, Corey Ten Boom, she's a, a marvelous woman. I, I would read her books. I, I would go on the internet and read her quotes. We got a number of them today that we're going to use. She's remarkable because her life was filled with so much hurt and so much trauma. And yet she's a picture of forgiveness. She was, she was born in Holland. She was born about the end of the 1800s, 1892 to be exact. And when the Germans started taking over Holland and coming and looking to hurt the Jews, her dad... Uh, made a, a place. I have a picture of her up here, I think. Uh, her dad made a, uh, this is her, in, she lived in California in the latter part of her life. Her dad uh, made a, a room that was behind a, a wall and you'd have to go through a cabinet to get into it. I think I have a picture of that up here at some point. And uh, they hid many, many Jews from being uh, brought to the gas chambers and, and to live. There was a neighbor who who busted them and, and, and they were arrested. The whole family was arrested. And the uh, father went to jail along with several of his kids and uh, Corey and her sister. And the father died 10 days later. Uh, 
Uh, the father's probably in his 70s or 80s when that happened. Maybe he was old, but that surely pushed him over the edge. Uh, the brothers and sister were released, but uh, Corey and her sister, um, Betsy, went off to a concentration camp, and there they suffered the atrocities of the, of the Germans in this concentration camp. And, and this is what Corey said about the memories that she had about her heart. And I pick her because if you're here with hard memories, she's the example for you. You say, Doug, you don't know what I've gone through. Maybe not, but, but, but Corey does. And here's what she says. Today I know that such memories, the memories of her pain, are the key not to the past, not to the past, but, but to the future. I know that the experiences of our lives, when we let God use them, key phrase, when you let God use those hard things in your life, if you'll do that, they become the mysterious and the perfect preparation for the work that he has for us to do. The loving, good God of the universe allows us to walk through times of heartache. And if we'll let God work in our life as he purposes, those will be used in a marvelous way to help us to be the people that God wants us to be. I can promise this, no matter what the pain is, no matter what the heartache is, no matter what the, what the sin was against you, no matter what you did, no matter what your shame, no matter what your grief, God can use that to turn that ugly thing into something that is so incredibly beautiful if we'll understand what forgiveness is and apply it correctly to our situation. If we will solve that problem biblically. What does the scripture have to say about this, friends? Is there a hope for how I've been uh, sinned against? Is there a hope for how I've sinned? And the answer today is yes, there, there is. There's a hope. So the problem is, look, look back at our text. It says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive them. If we confess our sins, he'll forgive us. So there's a subjectivity about that. Just because you have sins doesn't mean they get forgiven. There's, there's a condition. It just doesn't happen. And, and so there's got to be some way that we work, some way that we operate. We just can't sit there and do nothing and think that forgiveness is going to come upon us. It isn't. And so there's a subjectivity and we need to learn about that. What does forgiveness mean? How do I get forgiveness? How do I give forgiveness? Does forgiveness heal? Does it heal? Does forgiveness fix what is broken? What's our hope? Well, Corey Ten Boom tells us what our hope is. She says this. The tree on the mountain takes whatever the weather brings. Can do nothing about what comes its way. Just as though we can't do much about what comes our way. When we're sinned against, a kid who's molested can't do much about that. They're, they're just victimized. A tree on a mountain takes whatever it brings. It has no choice at all. But if it has any choice at all, it is to, to put its roots down as deeply as possible. As deeply as possible. It, it reminds me of, of Psalm 1. Let me read it quickly for you. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Verse 3. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither and all that he does he prospers. When we are like a tree that plants our roots deep down to God's water, then when the heat of life comes baking down upon us, we will not wither. And so your only choice, friends, is to live life like God's designed it for you to live if you want any kind of of hope, of experiencing the joy that he promises. And so I am asking you, no matter how scarred you've been, no matter how wicked you've been, would you consider the claims of the Bible as we talk about biblical forgiveness and then take that and apply it to your life so that you can overcome, so that you can have victory, so that you can be a person who is not haunted by your past memories, but you'll allow God to let those memories become a view of how you are to serve God in the future. So join me over this next hour and a half, this week and next week, as we look at what biblical forgiveness is all about. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to 
so we're still on that on your notes. We're still on the introduction part. I know it's got little no. So you're thinking we're going to be here for nine hours. We're not. We're going to whip through that last part pretty quick. Okay. And um, so there's divine forgiveness that's been promised. God's promised us divine forgiveness. I, there's a number of verses that show us that that's the case. I figured if we turn to those, it'll take us out more. And let me read those for you. If, if you want to do anything, just write down the references. You can look them up later. There's a, a thousand of these verses. But divine forgiveness is promised. Here's what it says in Psalm 103.3. It's God who forgives all of your iniquity and he heals all of your diseases. The disease of sin we're talking about, not the disease of illness necessarily. Although surely God can do that also. In Psalm 130 verse 4 it says, But you, but with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. In Matthew uh, 6.14, But if you forgive others and their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. There is the promise that the one who is holy, the one who has no darkness at all in him, the one who has his character defined by forgiveness, that one can look at people like me and like you who are so opposed to and anti humbling ourselves and forgiving. It's that God there says, if we'll act with forgiveness in our life, then God will act with forgiveness towards us. There's hope for us. We can experience forgiveness. You and I. It says in Acts 5.31, God exalted him, Jesus, at the right hand as the leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of their sins. In Acts 13.38, it says, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. We can be forgiven for missing the mark. We can be forgiven for voluntarily transgressing and doing it our own way. We can be forgiven for our sin. Name your sin. You can be forgiven for that sin. In Ephesians 1.7, my, my favorite of all the verses we're looking at here this morning. In him we have redemption. In, in him we've been bought back. We've been bought back from a place of, of, of horror. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. It's according to the riches of grace. He is, he is unlimited with his wealth. And it's according to those riches that, that we have grace for our sin. There is nothing that he can't buy back. There is nobody here who can't be bought back by the God who owns it all. And he promises that we can have that. And then our verse that we're looking at that sprung us into this study is out of 1 John 1.9. 1, it says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, notice that forgiveness precedes cleansing. If you want to be clean, the first step is you have to have forgiveness. We have to learn how to deal with our sin. And that's why this is so important. And so there's a divine perspective. There's a, a divine forgiveness that's promised. And there also is a human forgiveness that's commanded. We're commanded to forgive. So see, it's wonderful to be thinking about God who forgives us. But now we're going to see that there's a command given towards us. And we need to forgive one another. I love to get forgiveness from God. I squirm a little more when I have to give it to you. It's just the way I am. I, I mean, I don't see very many people smiling or shaking their head here. Maybe I'm the only one. Maybe I feel like I'm back in church when I was a kid again. But, but I really think that the reality is that all of us find that's the case. And here's what the Bible tells us about that. Uh, several verses that let us know about this. Um, first off, it's, we're talking about a tough hurt tough sin. You know, there's people that misuse forgiveness and they'll say this, I'll be walking out of the store, Barnes and Noble over at the Hoyt Mall. Everyone's in a rush and that door is big and heavy there. And so when the door's kind of swinging, everyone tries to squirt out and go through. So if I'm getting ready and it's my turn to come through, but someone else, you, come through and you squirt through in front of me and kind of cheat me and, and bump me as I go through. And you look at me and say, oops, sorry. And I go, no problem. Have we just witnessed a person who has a an attitude that wants forgiveness and a person who's given it. Nah, that's, that's too cheap. That's, that's too little. Anybody can do that. That isn't what's a picture of forgiveness. We're talking about things like this. I, I just wrote them down. We're talking about when you're hurt, when you get hurt, you need to offer forgiveness. When you're wounded, when you're injured, 
when you're damaged, when you're sore, when you're harmed, when you're aching, when you're tender and suffering, when you're upset, distressed, bruised, when you're even maimed, when you're broken, that results in a throbbing, stinging, unrelenting pain. When you've been offended, not when you go through the door and someone bumps you and says, oops, forgive me. When you've been offended, insulted, humiliated, used, abused, and disregarded. That kind of pain and heartache is a pain that God says, we must forgive. And I think there's probably some people thinking, really? You want me to do that? You don't know where I've been. You don't know what's gone on in my life. You don't know what I've done or what's been done to me. You don't have a clue. And I don't. I don't. I'm just looking at the Bible and we're going to find someone who does in just a minute. In Mark 11 it says this, Whenever you stand praying, whenever you stand praying, and I don't think you can sit and pray and think you're going to escape by this whole thing, okay? It's whenever you're praying, which I hope is often, because we should pray without ceasing. Whenever you're praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you and you're trespassing. When you're, when you're sitting and, and praying, forgive first so that your Father will forgive you. If, if you don't do that, then the inverse has to have some truth to it. That he won't forgive us. The one who walks in the light as he is in the light is the one who forgives like the one who is in the light. The one who, who sits in the chair praying forgives those, the people that have hurt and maimed and destroyed them and don't give a rip about them. Those people. We're commanded as believers if we walk in the light to be forgivers. To be forgivers. It says this in Luke's Gospel, 17, verse 4. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times and says, I repent. Remember the word repent? Repent means stop and turn. So, so I'm, I'm going this way. I'm wrong. Forgive me. Stop and turn. And then they do it again. And it's implied here that they're doing the same thing over again. Like over and over and over and over and over again. And, and, and they ask you. And you're thinking, I'm not a sucker. I mean, really. I was born at night, but not last night. And you think you're going to keep asking me? And the pattern, the pattern of a, of a believer who's walking in the light is one who continually forgives over and over and over and over. This is not really speaking to the person who's asking to the, for forgiveness as much as it's speaking to the person who's offering forgiveness. We need to have this attitude of letting people go. We'll talk about consequences. We'll talk about um, of, uh, of making uh, restoration in, in relationship. We'll talk about that next week. So, so there is some of that going on for sure. How about this verse, Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted. Notice that we've got to be kind and tender. So, so the attitude to have this is kind and tender. Not, oh, I'll forgive you. It, it isn't this crummy attitude. That's not forgiveness. That's mouth and words. So you can check your box. You can say, hey God, look at me. I just did it. God sees your heart. We need to be kind and tender hearted to the people who've just hurt us. who just used us. Forgiving one another. I can't do that. And, and then the verse goes on and says, as God in Christ forgave me, you, us. In the same way, we forgive as we've been forgiven. And, and to tell you the truth, the things that you do to me that I don't want to forgive you for are the exact things that I do to God. And He forgives me. And if I am in the light, then there's no darkness in me and I need to live like God Himself. Are you a, walk, a person who walks with Christ? Then this is how you'll live your life. In Colossians, it says, bearing, Colossians 3.13, bearing with one another, um, Bearing with one another, and, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. Forgiving each other. So if someone has a complaint against you, then to forgive that complaint. Um, as the Lord has forgiven you, you must forgive. So, so how, do we, how do we trust God for that, man? I mean, really. Again, when it's the little example, it's nothing. It's nothing. It's when it's, when it's me and it's crushing. And you probably could say, Doug, you don't get it. And maybe I don't, but I have someone who, who gets it. This Corey Temboom 
And I thought we'd take a few minutes to hear her testimony. So let's watch a video and see what she has to say about this. It was some time ago that I was in Berlin. And there came a man to me and said, Ah, Mr. Bohm, I am glad to see you. Don't you know me? And suddenly I saw that man that was one of the most cruel officers, guards, in the concentration, in concentration camp. And that man said, I have, I'm now a Christian, I have found the Lord Jesus. I read my Bible and I know that there is forgiveness for all the sins of the whole world, also for my sins. I have forgiveness for the cruelties I have done. But then I have asked God grace for an opportunity that I could ask one of my very victims forgiveness. And Fräulein Tambom wants him here forgiven. Will you forgive me? And I could not. I remembered the suffering of my dying sister through him. But when I saw, when I experienced that I could not forgive, suddenly I knew I myself have no forgiveness. Do you know that Jesus has said that? When you do not forgive those who have sinned against you, my heavenly Father will not forgive you your sins. And I, I knew, oh, I'm not ready for Jesus coming because I have no forgiveness for my sins. But I was not able, I could not, I could only hate him. And then I took one of these beautiful texts, one of these boundless resources, Romans 5.5. 5. The love of God is shed abroad into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. And I said, thank you Jesus, that you have brought into my heart God's love through the Holy Spirit who has given to me. And thank you, Father, that your love is stronger than my hatred and unforgiveness. That same moment, I was. And I could say, brother, give me your hand. And I shook hands with him. And it was as if I felt God's love stream through my arms. You never touch so the ocean of God's love as that you forgive your enemies. forgive? No. I can't either. But he can. And so, Corey Tim Boom lost her dad. She saw a number of people that she knew and loved, and Jewish people who were murdered and abused. She went to the concentration camp and watched her sister abused and finally killed. And, and then the very man who, who acted against her sister comes and asks her for forgiveness. Oh, I might not know your pain. And, and I might not know where you've been. And, and I might not understand your hurt. I, I understand that. But there are people who have experienced biblical forgiveness, both giving to them and, and living it out, who can. And so, if you want to know the joy that John spoke about, then we need to understand what this forgiveness is. And so for the remainder of our, our day, we'll, we'll look at exactly what that forgiveness is. Corey says this, in the darkness of one's life, in the hardest times, it's when God's truth shines most clear. I, I think you'll find that this is the case too. Embrace this and, and grasp it and, and hold on to what it is that biblical, biblical forgiveness is all about. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at kind of like a seminar on forgiveness over the next week and a half. And uh, so that's what all your notes are for. Let's take a look at those. The first is going to be this. Forgiveness is always required. <clears throat> Let's make sure that's stated correctly. Forgiveness is always 
required. That's why I put so much effort into making sure that you understand that I'm, I'm not missing where some of you have been. I, I know you've been hurt. Forgiveness is always required. It's required by you and it's required by me. If we're going to be a church and a people that are going to solve problems, and that's the kind of church we need to be, no matter what kind of problems come our way, we want to solve them. We want to solve them. Then forgiveness is always required. It's God's way. And, and how come? Because it's commanded. It's commanded by God. And it says in Ephesians 4 2, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. That's a command for us. We're to be kind and tender as we forgive others. Just as Christ in uh, just as God in Christ forgave you. And, and so there's a hard command here. So let's see exactly how we do that. It's demonstrated uh, that it demonstrates that we understand what God's forgiveness is all about. And uh, there's a text that I think we need to read. It's, a, it's got a little bit of length to it. It's in Matthew chapter 18. You can turn there if you want. I'm going to read it for you. It's a story that helps us to understand what forgiveness is about. And so I'm going to pick it up in verse 21 and read through verse 35. It says this. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? How, how generous do I need to be with this? And as many as seven times? Uh, the, the going rate was three. But he said seven times two plus one? I mean, that's pretty generous. And Jesus said to him, I, I do not say seven times, but 77 times. There, there's some discrepancy if that's 70 times seven or 77. Uh, to me, it really doesn't matter. After two or three, I mean, you're in for me. I mean, I, I'm living that. 77 or 490, it doesn't matter to me. So, so we need to continually forgive. And the word of Jesus is that we need to forgive over and over and over. And, and this is what Jesus said and went on and gave his story to explain it. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle his accounts with his servants, and he began to settle. One was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. If I get the right numbers, this is like $10 million. It, it's millions and millions of dollars. You can't pay it back. You're, you're, you're hopelessly, hopelessly going to try to pay this back. Can't be done. His debt is too large. And since he couldn't pay it back, his master ordered him to be sold, and his wife and his children, and all that he had, and payment to be made, He'd sell the guy, and sell his wife, sell the kids, sell his stuff, recoup some of his money back. That's the way they did it back then. Mess with somebody, the master gets to sell you. So the servant fell on his knees, and he implored him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. He's pleading with him for mercy, because he can't pay it back. He's already acknowledged that. Give me mercy. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave his debt. It's gracious, isn't it? It's wonderful to be forgiven a debt. I don't know if you've ever been forgiven a debt, but it's wonderful to be forgiven one. Um, but, when, uh, but when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. We're talking like tens of dollars. Like we're talking nothing. Like any of us could really just pull out the wallet and pay that right now. I mean, this guy had a millions of dollars of debt. And he goes and sees his buddy, fellow servants. He has... 20 bucks of debt. He sees him. And he seized him and he began to choke him saying, pay me what you owe me. And so the fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. The first servant refused and he went out and he put him in prison until he should pay the debt. And when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and they reported to their master all that had taken place. And the master summoned him and said, You wicked servant, I forgave you all of your debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have the mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, the master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all of his millions and, and millions and, and millions and millions of dollars of debt. So also... My heavenly Father will do to, to you and to me. Every time I say you, I, and I like using the word you instead of us, because I think us kind of just kind of melts it. You points at you. But I always think I'm sitting at you with you when I'm saying that. He'll do to you if you do not forgive your brother. What's the word say? From your heart. God knows, man. God knows. If we who have 
been forgiven so much that God was willing to kill his own son for, his own son, then you better believe that if God had that kind of wrath against sin that he'd kill his own son, that he will kill you also. You're not skating on this. You're not getting away on this. I'm not getting away on this. God is dead serious about this sin thing because it destroys and wrecks and ruins and crushes and hurts and separates. He's serious about this. And he said, we need to, to follow his heart and, and do like he does. You see, we're saying that forgiveness is always required because it demonstrates that one understands who's God's forgiveness is. And, and when we understand how much we've been forgiven, then we can certainly forgive others just that small sum that they've done against me or I've done against you. That, that's the pattern for us. Because if we fail to forgive... It can be a sign that one is not really saved. And Matthew 6.14 says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Inversely, we could say, So if you don't forgive your, uh, your brothers their trespasses, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. It, there's an implication there that you were never, never saved. We, we see that in Matthew 13 when it talks about all the different kinds of people who get saved and it compares their hearts to soil. Some are on hard packed soil, some are on rocky soil, some are on thorny soil, and some are on good soil. And the ones who are on rocky and thorny soil, they give the appearance of being Christians, but they're not. And so there's people out there that give the appearance of giving Christians. They'll stay before God one day. Lord, Lord, didn't I perform miracles? And didn't I and let me into heaven? And he'll say to those people, whoever they might be, I never knew you. There's people who are claiming Christ. They claim Christ, but they won't forgive. The indication is, the indication is that they've never been saved. Now, I don't think I'd use that to go and point out people who are not saved. Like, last week when I had my little mouth attitude thing going on, and it took me like about 15 hours to get it from my hearing it to into my brain to think about it and down to my heart, I don't want anybody saying, you mustn't be saved over that 15 hours. So, that's really about me to be thinking about, not necessarily for you to be judging me, okay? So that's where I think we need to go with this. It's a warning to you. Do you have a forgiving spirit? If you don't, then there's something to be said about that. So, and forgiveness is an act of the whole person. It's an act of the whole person, okay? Uh, forgiveness is a, it's a commitment. It's a commitment. Forgiveness is a, it's a declaration. It's a, it's a declaring. It, it's not feeling something, but it's saying something. It, it isn't feeling. It, if you asked me to forgive every time I felt with it, I'll tell you, the line of times that I would be forgiving would be incredibly, incredibly, incredibly small. I just don't feel like it. Because people become a bother to me. Situations become a bother to me. I'm better than that. I'm more important than that. You stepped in my... Whatever. I'm incredibly self-centered at times. Incredibly self-centered. And... and I don't necessarily feel like it. it. Forgiveness, so mark this. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a commitment. It's, it's, it's a commitment. It's the definition, I think it's in your notes, says this. It's a commitment by the offended to pardon graciously the repentant from um, two things, moral liability and to be reconciled to that person. Although... Not all the consequences are eliminated. So, so watch this. So that little, I, I don't even know it all, but that little uh, nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put poor Humpty together again. And God can. He can put Humpty together back again. And when he does, he's cracked. And he's got... Scars and broken. Sin scars. Watch yourself. I'll do this and I'll ask for forgiveness. That little joke that we say, it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. And it, it isn't. Because your sin scars. My sin scars. It breaks. It destroys. It hurts. It, it, it ruins. It distorts. It crushes. And, and when we sin, 
It, things can't be put back perfect. We can solve the problem of sin. That we can do. But it still breaks and, and hurts things. And so when someone comes to sin, and someone sins against this, it's like, and I'll use Cheryl and I as the example. We love each other. We, we slipped on our rings about 25, 26 years ago. I think it's 26. <clears throat> and uh, going on 27. And, uh, um, and, and we haven't taken them off. I, I've barely, I don't think I've ever spent more than 10 minutes with my ring off. I just don't think I have. And it's a symbol of, of what we did. We committed to each other. Till death do us part. Divorce is not in our lingo. It is not in our lingo. Death might be at times, but divorce is not. Uh, that's Cheryl, by the way. <laughs> um, and, and then we're committed to each other. But, but sometimes she or I will do things, and it, it comes between us. It's, this sin comes, and it pushes us apart. It, it pushes us apart. So when I sin against her, and then I come to ask her for forgiveness, uh, I come and I say, guilty. I'm guilty. That's the repenting part. I, I was going this way. God said, Doug, you can't go that way. I turn and say, that's it. Guilty. I come and say, sure, I'm, I'm guilty. I might have destroyed us. We might be cracked and, and, and scarred. I, my sin has done things that have hurt us in our relationship. And they've had long lasting consequences. Foolish, selfish sin has caused cracks in our relationship. So we're not minimizing it. I, I come to her and I say, guilty. She's got me. I owe her. I'm in her debt. I am guilty to her. I've offended her. She's got me. And then I come and I ask, please forgive me. I don't feel like it necessarily, but I'm asking her to let me go. Let me go. And when she forgives me, she's not saying, Oh, it's nothing. Oh, everyone does it. Oh, it's okay. It is not nothing. It doesn't matter if everyone does it. And it's not okay. She simply says to the guilty party, I'll let you go. And we've just observed forgiveness. It's a choice on her part. It's a commitment on her part. I commit to letting you go. You're guilty. I let you go. That's, that's what it is. And, and then she lets me go from my... I'm no longer morally liable. And it, it takes the thing that's between us and it, it removes it. There are consequences. There are things that are broken from our sin. But it removes it from us. And now we can be together again. We can be together again. It, it, it's a beautiful thing. Problems are meant for solving. How can you handle the problems I've had? We can't fix everything in your problem, but what we can do is we can remove what separates you from God and you from others. That we can do. And it happens by you coming and asking people, will you let me go? Forgive me. Then you don't say anything else. You stop. You don't say, everyone does it. I, it's my bent. It's the way. You just stop. I'm guilty. Let me go. And then it is required by the offended to say as they look heavenward and think how they've been forgiven for, for their great transgression before the high, holy, perfect, without darkness king. And they look and they say, I'll let you go. Forgiven. Done. Transacted. Applied to your account. It's a beautiful thing. Practically, practically, um, that commitment involves three concrete actions. They're listening to your notes, but listen to this first. This is really going to be a promise not to remember this anymore. It's a promise not to remember. So God says, he says, uh, I won't remember your sin any longer. Hebrews uh, uh, 10 verse 17 says, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. That's the promise you're making. Won't remember it anymore. You're thinking, come on, Doug. That's the girl bumping into you as you walk out of Barnes & Noble. You won't remember that. That's easy not to remember. You don't know what, a, what I've gone through. Uh, what do you mean, don't remember it anymore? It's scarred. 
and branded into my brain and my memories. Think Corey Timboom. Branded into her. Her sister, brutalized, murdered, died. And, and how, do you, how do you handle that? It, how do I do that, God, if I'm supposed to be like you? Well, really, God can't forget anything, can he? I mean, it's not in his character. He can't forget. He, he can't forget. He doesn't forget. He doesn't go, ah, oh, I forgot that. It's a good thing. It's, it's a good thing he can't forget. Here's what he's saying. I choose not to remember. I choose not to remember. That's a different than forgetting. I choose not to remember. Um, he no longer holds it against us. Guilty. Forgive me. I let go. I no longer hold you morally liable for that. You're forgiven. And, and what we need to do is make a commitment not to remember when people sin against us. We need to make a commitment. Now, I know that we'll struggle to varying degrees, some of us more than others, and all of us more on some subjects than other subjects. I get it. I mean, I get that. I get that like you get that. We're making a commitment. I will not remember that any longer. And you'll do that to three people. You won't remember that. If I offend you, I won't remember it to you. I won't look at you and snicker and go, huh, you owe me, man. I forgave you, but you really owe me. You say anything and I'm going to use this card. You own me. It's a commitment that says, I won't bring it up to you any longer. I won't look at you. I won't smirk at you. I won't say, hmm. It's a commitment that you won't bring it up to that person. It's a commitment also that you won't bring it up with other people. We're really sly in this. We understand in our church, we won't say anything with our mouth. Got me. But when they bring up somebody, and you got your mouth pinched, because you can't say anything, and they say something, you go like this. Hmm. Ha <laughs> ha. You make a body motion. You make a face motion. You're screaming with your mouth that that person's guilty, and you know it. You're, you're saying, when they say, Doug is a good guy, he wouldn't lie. And you go, didn't say a word. But you screamed. And you chose to remember it against the person. And what's going on when we forgive? We are choosing not to remember. Choosing not to hold it against them. Choosing not to bring it up to the person or to any other person. I tend to, to not do this all the time. I just thought I should be really straight with you when I'm talking to you about how big of a sinner I am. I tend to have a mouth that can bring those kinds of things up and can speak about those things. It's nasty. And here's what I'm asking for you if you're my friend. I'm asking you to come up to me toe to toe and say, Doug, you just violated the forgiveness that you offered to that person. That is wrong and sinful. That is wrong and sinful. W would you hold me accountable to that? I, I tend to blow that. You you'll have to do it. But it would be a better thing for me because I want to experience the joy of my master. And if I don't live that forgiveness, I can't have that joy. And you can help me. You can help me by being in check. You can do that. And I'll help you. I'll help you. So we're going to choose to forget it. We're going to choose not to remember it. We're going to choose not to hold it against the other person. All the same thing. We're going to choose to do it with three people. We've talked to two. And we're going to choose not to bring it up to the other person. We're going to choose not to bring it up to other people. And, and then the, the third one is we're going to choose not to bring it up to, uh, to dwell in our own mind. It's the rot inside. It's to grow bitter. I can't say anything about that jerk because I know that's wrong. And I can't even wink my eye at that other person because I know that's wrong too. But in my mind where no one else is, I'm going to give it to them every single day. How's that working for you? It ain't working good, man. You're looking for that joy? You ain't going to get it. We find the joy when we let people go. Why is that? 
Because we find joy when we become more and more Christ-like. We don't just say do that for fun. We become more and more joy when we become like Christ. And when we become like, like Christ, there's the joy that we're searching and longing for. To be like God with forgiveness. Not like we were. It's against our character, but like it is the characteristic of a God. To forgive. That's when we find joy. Now listen to this. Forgetting, true forgetting, is a byproduct of, of forgiveness. And, and it's because we choose not to think about it. And as we choose not to think about it, we tend to forget it. But if we keep on thinking about it, we can't forget it. So forgiveness, true biblical forgiveness, has as a, as a byproduct forgetting. What a, a beautiful thing it is for us to have that. All right. Let's just get through this and then we'll pick it up next week. C is this, that forgiveness is closely related to reconciliation. We've talked about that. We remove our sin. When we remove our sin, it stops the separation that goes on between us. Forgiveness is not predicated on forgetting. We've talked about that already. It's, uh, some offenses are never forgotten. Some things are just cruel. But what we can do is choose not to remember any longer. And while feelings will be present, while feelings will be present, forgiveness is not predicated on, on feeling. Read MacArthur's quote there. It's, it's an amazing little quote. I'd encourage you to read it when we get home. Listen to what Corey Ten Boom said this. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Isn't that beautiful? The will to forgive can function because I desire to be in fellowship with the Most High God who is light with no darkness at all, and I choose to walk in the light as he is in the light, not as I would define the light, as he is in the light, perfect with no darkness. And when I walk like that, when I choose to do that, no matter how I feel, I can act in that way. It's, it's a beautiful thing. And then we'll end here. But forgiveness does not necessarily mean that there aren't consequences. There, there are consequences. We'll talk about those. We'll talk about restoration. We'll talk about picking up the pieces. We'll talk about moving on. We'll talk about all these different things. Um, sin scars and it breaks and, and we know that there, there's consequences that are on. So, so don't sin. Don't sin. Choose not to sin. But if you do sin, then, then this is the step this week. We'll learn more about it next week. I'm guilty. Would you let me go? And then your response is the offended one is not, not yeah, you are guilty and, and, and not yeah, that was gross, and yeah, not that hurt me, and not, yeah, well, we'll see, and I'll see if it's genuine. This, this, we'll see if it's genuine business. It's not what the Bible says about forgiveness. It's having an attitude of forgiving. It's offering forgiveness. If we practice this, the Bible tells us that our joy can be complete. I, I hope that you'll think about, pray about, and work on that. If this week you have things to ask for forgiveness, I... I encourage you to, to think about that, to get it right between you and God, ask for forgiveness there, and then to go and talk to your friend, your, your spouse, your, your mother, your, your father, your, your whoever it might be, and ask for forgiveness. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful that Jesus forgave us. Uh, we're grateful that most of us probably could say we're the chief of all sinners, if, if our hearts were to be plastered on the PowerPoint screen this morning, we, we'd all see that. And you've forgiven us. Help us to live that pattern out in our life and to forgive others. Give us the grace to choose and to commit to letting people go. Because we believe that problems are meant for solving. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.